Well, we have an interesting subject this morning, but it is one which has been considered, reconsidered, denied, and affirmed over periods of thousands of years. Apparently, we are all confronted with the mystery of solving uh, more or less completely the major issues of life. We have not gotten very far in that procedure up to the present time. We have found many answers, but not the answer to the major issues of existence. Sir Edwin Arnold, in his poem, The Light of Asia, makes the Buddha to say, Veil upon veil we lift, but find veil upon veil behind. And this is more or less the situation as it is. Every solution that we find proves to require in its own turn another solution. And so the problem goes on and on. And we are all trying to find the essential answers to the problems of daily existence. Now the human being is endowed with three basic powers of thoughtfulness and examination. He has the mystery of the heart which is more or less the mystery of religion. He has the mystery of the mind, which is largely fulfilled by philosophy and learning. And he has the mystery of the hand, which is in the keeping of science. With his hands, his mind, and his heart, he must build his own way in a very mysterious universe. Actually, As we go along, we hear a great many different opinions today about some of these issues. But still we must face the fact that we must find some basic convictions. We must get things down to their roots. Dispose in one way or another of the many layers of fallacies and theories and conflicts which have built up in every level of our in education and our spiritual culture. We see, for example, that today our religious world is in a very bad condition. All over the world, members of religions are fighting their own members and also the members of all other religions. We find that instead of the religion of love which was brought to us by the great world teachers, We have a theology of conflicts. We have a series of, we'll say, misunderstandings, which are built up to massive proportions. Every day now, some small group finds a reason to hate some other small group, and the large groups hate the small ones, and it goes on and on in a great problem of conflict for control, for domination, for possession of the life of the individual. In our religious life, our conflicts go back to a very basic point. What is religion? Is religion one of the many conflicting creeds, or is religion a totality in itself? Is religion a basis upon which to build a life? Are all these various religions merely translations and interpretations of one eternal faith? If if that is true and there is a basic religion, what is it? How can we escape the conflict of sectarianisms and persecutions and inquisitions if we are in the presence of a faith, the purpose of which is to make our lives better and bring us closer to an ideal way of existence. What is the problem of these religions? Why can they not get together? Why are the creeds more important than conduct? Why is it more important to argue over the translation of a book than it is to understand or read the book itself? Day after day, year after year, the homely and common truths of things have been reinterpreted, reanalyzed, 
The search for older source material goes on and on and on. But the religious world, four-fifths at least of the human race, is in pitiful condition. It has come to the point where the face that were given to us to preserve our inner lives are now almost on the verge of destroying us. Everywhere the truths are ignored. What is religion? Is religion something that has to be creedalized? Does it have to be a sectarian approach to spiritual understanding? Can we not recognize the final ultimate basis of religion? And that is, love ye one another. Now all the theology in the world cannot destroy that or create a peaceful existence without it. The real contribution of religion is love. Love, fellowship, service, mutual consideration, compassion for all that lives. It is the purpose of religion to bring people together. But by various contrivances, we have so integrated or organized our faiths that they live in constant antagonism with each other. And on what grounds are these antagonisms? Well, primarily on the assumption, which is held throughout the world, that each individual or each community or each communion of religion, each one is the only true one. No matter how much you try to interpret or understand these facts, the fact remains, as my old doctor friend said, there are only two doxies in this world. Orthodoxy, which is my religion, heterodoxy, which is everybody else's. <laughs> so this becomes a loyalty not to truth, but a loyalty to an institution. Even if we understand this institution historically, we must admit that there are areas of it which are not worthy of loyalty. But we go right on, convinced and concerned only, with the victory of our own belief over everyone else's. This is not love. Love suffereth long and is kind. Love forgives. Love strives in every way possible to make things happier and better for even the stranger outside the gate. But we have not recognized the primary purpose of religion. Love is religion, and hate is atheism. Hate is a danger to all that lives. It is arousing the selfishness, the competitiveness in the human personality for the destruction of mankind. The only answer is to recognize that religion has one basic fact. Love ye one another. Now, you don't have to hang a name on that. It has been known everywhere. Akhenaten taught it in Egypt 1,200 years before the birth of Christ. It is in every code that man has ever had, namely, that each one shall think not of his own good alone, but of the good of all. Democracy is a policy. It's based upon cooperation, mutual union for common good. And all these things have gradually faded away. Now, philosophy also has its part in the entire study of things. Philosophy is a very interesting problem. Here we have a human being standing in a desert, the desert of waiting. He has been standing there for ages, with the sky above him, earth under his feet, the sun glaring down, and occasionally a flood endangering his life. This individual standing on that spot of ground, or if we want to enlarge it, this little planet which we call the earth, tries desperately to understand why he is here. What is he here to do? Where did he come from? Where is he going? What should he be doing that he isn't doing? And what should he stop doing that he is doing? Somehow out of this situation, the individual must integrate a code of personal conduct. And this is basically called philosophy. 
philosophy is nothing but organized, carefully thought out common sense. Now, the man standing in the desert, or each of us standing where we are, our philosophy is not and cannot be absolute. We do not know more than we can understand. We do not understand more than we are. But all the way along, there have been provisions made to help the individual to improve his own conduct, to increase his own skills, and protect himself from the natural dangers of life, and to build towards some kind of a future. There is a maturity for mankind. But philosophy today is not much concerned with these problems. It is a series of intellectual squabbles. It is what Voltaire calls learned people throwing three-legged stools at each other's heads. We are not really concerned. A new book comes out to refute an old one. Someone decides a new way of thinking about something, probably never has applied it to himself, but is for giving it to the whole world as a new solution to a t an eternal problem. With all the solutions, the problem goes on. Every time we explore a little deeper, we find a greater need for insights and understanding. And these facilities are not always available. The purpose of philosophy and its basic r rule is ethical. How we can live with each other and survive. How we can face the problems of each other. How we can overcome the antagonisms of each other. And how we can build an intellectual cooperative in this strange, mysterious world where everything seems to be organized except humanity. So we try to find some basis for thinking. We know it is not going to be eternal, it's not going to be inevitable. But it must be enough so that we can get together and work out our problems in peace. It must be that the mind and the brain have been given us to use, not to abuse. And the use means that we must apply every faculty that we have to the improvement of our lives and the expansion of our relationships with the universe in which we live. Therefore, out of uh, thinking comes philosophy. And the great philosophical systems of the world are not wrong. Most of them have been de developed to, for a people in a place at a time. But even this does not mean they are not enduringly significant. Fifty philosophies of life in the world in its great unfoldment have had the golden rule. Almost word for word. Nearly every philosophy worth following has tried to give the individual the stamina to grow constructively without destroying others who are also trying to grow constructively. Therefore, philosophy is a harmonizer of beliefs. It is a means by which the individual uses every mental resource at his disposal to make more secure his own relationship with life. Philosophy must improve that part of him which is inside of himself and which must necessarily come in contact with the consequences of the inside consciousness of other people. So down underneath all of everything, whereas religion gave us love, philosophy gives us ethics. Ethics is a standard of relationship. It is that which proves beyond any question of doubt that that which injures one injures all, and that where is we use our wisdom to exploit each other, we are also digging our own graves. Ethics becomes a basis of all values. Ethics in business, ethics in uh, science, ethics in advertising, entertainment, amusement, education, all these institutions must be ethically maintained or else the problem will be lost for all. So the mind gives us the right to be honorable, to be honest, 
not because of the fear of God, but because that we have a proper religious admiration and love for all other things and must protect them. So we have in philosophy a protection of rights, a perpetuation of values, and we also have a rationalization, a study, by which we are able to divide the knowable from the unknowable, and to finally come to the realization that the unknowable is still the ruler of all things. Now, when it comes to science, we have the human hand. We have that part of the individual which is concerned with the physical world in which he lives. In the physical world, he must establish the securities that he needs for his survival and for the advancement of his kind. In other words, the hand is labor. It is definitely science. For the end of science is to protect the life of the human being. But after all, science has had a very spotted background. The sciences as we know them today are comparatively recent. And the scientific objectives which we cherish today are not always consistent with our needs. I think the great problem that we have with science is that it remains and has always been more or less unscientific. It talks about science, but a science that ignores the problem of human life and tries to explore the heavens has missed something. It has missed the urgency of applying skill to the immediate need of living things. Now, there are some areas in which science has made very valuable contributions, but the whole theory of science seems to be based upon the assumption that out there everything is mystery. And in order to be able to do the ordinary jobs of like living, we must solve this mystery, this abstract, this absolute. We must try to discover, if we can, the eternal cause of existence. Well, as far as that's concerned, science has more or less given up. It realizes that apparently the very truth most necessary to it is unavailable. That no matter how far we go through galaxies and dark holes and, and all the mathematical calculations that we have, the great reality evades us. These calculations are magnificent. They reveal strange and wonderful things. And to young people starting out in life, they are the source of a great enthusiasm, a great hope a tremendous excitement. But when it is all said and done, the Persian poet summed up it all with a simple state, statement, man is born, man suffers, and man dies. Somewhere in this vastness of science, we are overlooking the immediacy of the need of practical answers to living problems that instead of worrying continuously about the advancement across the frontiers of the unknown, we have a problem in our own backyard that is in desperate need of scientific skills. Because in, in the end, from the standpoint of science, the search is still for truth. But in this case, the truth of utility, how to use the things we have to the best good of all concerned. The greatest contribution of science must also be responsibility. A scientist should never invent or discover or circulate or propaganda anything which he cannot control. He should not be able to create weapons that will destroy him. He should not be able to make discoveries which lead to unemployment, to sickness and death, because they are inconsistent with the ethics of living. So science has the practical job, not of relieving everyone of work, but of finding work for everyone. Constructive labor. All labor-saving devices endanger the economy of mankind. Yet today we feel these to be necessary. Why? Because we have departed from the roots and foundations of our forebears. 
and to make this sound reasonable and to make our feelings less hurt or less endangered, we take it for granted and promulgate the idea that the old things were not very much good. Antiquity was nice while you were in antiquity, but now we've outgrown it. We've outgrown Socrates, we've outgrown Buddha, we've outgrown all of these. We've even outgrown our own Christianity. These things were for little people growing up. But great, big, strong people like today do not need anything like that. All they need is to build a weapon big enough to prevent themselves from being destroyed. But in the process, probably inventing something that will destroy the very world they are trying to save. So we have now a great argument against ethics, against morality, and against religion because they are old-fashioned. Well, now what is old-fashioned? Old-fashioned, we might say, can best be detected or discovered uh, by a study of what happens and how things came into existence that are important to us. One of the oldest codes of ethics and morality the world has known was the Cone of Hammurabi, King of Babylonia. This code was brought into existence 1800 B.C. Now, that's a long time back. That would be very easy to outgrow, we would think. We ought to be a long way from Babylonia. The country is gone, but the code lingers on. Well, what does the code say? The code says that if you cheat your neighbor, you're going to be punished for it. If you build a house and shoddy the goods and materials and it falls down, you build another one without charge or else you go to jail. If you steal, you are punished. If you perform good labors, you are honored. You are expected to honor your parents. You are expected to honor society and keep the rules of society, protect and raise your children properly, and live a good, solid, serious life without too much alcohol. Now, this is what they believed 1,800 years before the beginning of the Christian era. Well, you can see from the very statement that it was very impractical. <laughs> it, was, it was against all of the best rules of competition. It would prevent miscellaneous characters from gradually controlling the world by finance alone and defending the finance with heavy artillery and bombs. Oh, that is so ancient. We have outgrown things like that. We have outgrown the dignity of the home. We have outgrown the dignity of the respect for parents. We have outgrown the love of labor and the realization that God likes people who work. Now God rewards people for not working. All this was very prehistoric. You couldn't possibly tell the individual today who has just come out of Yale or Harvard that the old code has immediate and vital meaning. Well, a while after that came along one of the greatest thinkers of antiquity, Akhenaten, king of Egypt. The Pharaoh, who was the first uh, long, long ago to say that all living peoples, all creatures, in fact, were created free and equal. That every individual, regardless of his station, is worthy of respect. He is to be respected for what he does and for what he is and not for what he has. And that's real heresy. You have realized that that's totally unreasonable. We must respect people who have large bank accounts. We must allow those with the greatest means to be the ideals that we struggle to emulate. It was Akhenaten also who was the first patron of woman suffrage. And when he married Nefertiti, and they sat together on the throne of Egypt, he would refer to her, my queen, who is myself. No break, no interval, equal in every respect. He also was one of those who brought out the rather simple idea that was too fast for its own time, that war was a mistake that you did not fight, 
that war will never produce peace. He knew that. And for that he died. Died as a young man, either of a broken heart or by poison, according to what account you read. Because the country wanted war, profit. It wanted to break down the idea of equalities and enslave humanity. Now, about the same time as Akhenaten was flourishing in Egypt for a while, Moses received the tablets of the law from the peaks of Sinai. And the Ten Commandments, or the Decalogue, is about 3,000 years, maybe a little more than 3,000 years old. Obviously extinct. We don't have those kind of things anymore. Honor thy father and thy mother. Mm -mm. Interferes with the prophet system. Uh, Be good to the stranger. Take in the helpless and the homeless and feed them. Oh no, not now. And Moses didn't have any social security to back him up either. (laughs) Moses said, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not bear false witness. All these things. But that was 3,000 or more years ago. And they tell us now that we, we shouldn't pay attention to those kind of things. We've outgrown them. And we've outgrown them so far and so fast that we are in desperate condition Uh, from the pressures that we put upon our own personalities. The first Christian code was that of Justinian. And it added to the other factors, elements, certain graces of the spirit, uh, certain new dimensions of human idealism. It made the New Testament, particularly the Sermon on the Mount, a basis of legal construction. You could build a code upon it that could be properly applied and and enforced. This also was quite a long time ago. But every code that has come along since that time has been a little worse. Day by day the codes go down instead of the people rising. And in order to govern people today, you have to apparently excuse all their limitations, forgive all their misdemeanors, and tell them that they live in a free enterprise system. Now this seems to interfere with the idea of a universe that has something ruling it beside the individual. Now here we can go back to another earlier period of time before people wrote codes. These earlier times are still represented by primitive peoples or the traditions that they have left behind. One of the most common codes of antiquity was that the only way that the individual at this time can come to any understanding of right and wrong is by observing life around him. Nature is his best teacher. Nature tells him what he can do and what he cannot do. And in the ancient times, primitive peoples obeyed nature. In our modern and far more advanced culture, we do everything possible to evade and avoid natural law. We do not want natural law to hold control. We know what happens, but we don't care. We know that natural law is not in favor of cocaine, but it's used. We know that natural law is not in in favor of destroying the lives and securities of other people. But we do it. Little by little we have created a new attitude, an amoral attitude toward existence. We have rejected all of the footings that we have ever discovered and in the place of them create a code of complete individual prerogatives. Do as you please. Well, that would be maybe a little more excusable if we did something that was pleasing, but we don't. And we find ourselves, little by little, bringing down all of the principles that once inspired us and making them servants to our ambitions. We make virtues out of our vices instead of trying to correct them. Yet we live in a universe which we must face sometime. We haven't solved it. We have not been able to bribe the infinite. 
we have not been able to place one of our own kind on the throne of heaven. We do not know how to administer ourselves, but all wise providence has also given us such limitations that there are only certain mistakes that we can make. If we knew of more, we would make them also, but fortunately we don't know all of them. But here is a world that the we're looking for basics in. And here we have a whole world of, of object lessons. We can go to every part of the earth and find out the truths of things. We can sit quietly and watch, even on television, a great many things that are essentially true if we want to think about them, or untrue of which we should know about. And yet, with all these things, the individual makes very little effort to change himself. He knows that things are wrong, but he believes that freedom is very important. He has come to the conclusion that freedom is the right to do wrong. It is the right to do as he pleases. But then, if he was scientific, he would know this is not true. There isn't an atom that floats in space that is free. Everything is under immutable energy principles and laws. A man is also under these laws, and he has tried from the beginning of his existence to wiggle out from under them. He has tried to create a human code of existence that will hold and survive in a divine world of immutable principles. At least after all these ages, we have reached a point where we can contemplate something of this immutable world in which we live. We begin to realize that somewhere out there, where we do not know, but we're not going to find it out where it is by means of space flights, because these things are all on a level. They are part of a phys physical experience of enlargement, but the answer does not lie in the physical. The answer comes through the physical, but from a source much higher than itself. So we are looking for peace in, uh, in corpuscles and in atoms and molecules, when we can only find it on an entirely different basis. We have to recognize gradually that the foundation of life is something that we build with the heart, the mind, and the hands. Build it ourselves. Build it through our own conduct. Most of all mystics from the earliest time have held it to be true that growth is the basis of enlightenment, that the individual must come to a higher state of understanding because he has achieved a higher state of conduct. Now this is one of the problems that has been known from the times of the Greeks and Hammurabi and the pharaohs of Egypt and back even further into the mysteries of the cave dwellers. Namely, that to be better, you must do better. You must solve problems, or the problems will come back. You cannot avoid, avoid responsibility without uh, having the consequences of avoidance to live with. These things are very obvious and very sensible, and there's no one that lives through a normal lifespan who hasn't plenty of evidence accumulated to make these necessary improvements in himself. But again, we are in a, pr in a problem. And in this problem, I think we have to recognize that most people are in a state of great confusion. They are in confused with fear and uncertainties. They are reaching out for solutions, but the solutions for the most part are problems in character and integrity and these are not yet the dominant approach to the solution of difficulties. We are looking for a, an answer to a world that seems to be crumbling around us. And in this state of things, fear moves in. This fear leads to neurosis. And this neurosis leads to a whole complex of psychological conditions. The individual, frightened to death, over the problems of the day, discouraged and variously afflicted by the competitions around him in life, 
is looking for peace of mind, peace of soul, peace of living. And he doesn't know where to find it, and he doesn't know how to find it. Now, out of all of this also, we have another phenomenon coming along. These disturbed, uncertain, uh, or mostly anxious people, in whose personal lives difficulties are piling up, are developing internal hypersensitivities, uh, which can break through through a series of psychic phenomena. This psychic phenomena uh, is, has been a problem since the beginning of history. And there's no denying that some of it is genuine, but there's also no way of denying that much of it is an escape mechanism of a troubled mind. And where this comes along, the individual is apt to find that he is self-deluded and that he is also escaping the real fact. It is easier to hope to dream one's way to enlightenment than it is to sit down and take care of the problems that are causing the trouble. So to get down to basics, growth is a matter of improvement and control and discipline. It is not a problem of hope and expectancy and various escape mechanisms which look as though they might make life a little more comfortable, but in the end generally make it more des desperate and dangerous. Actually, the internal life is part of a divine plan. It is true as it was in the days of, of Egypt and the Grecian philosophers that those who are able to improve the standard of their own personal living are the ones who are keeping the rules and therefore capable of having a good religion, a good philosophy, and a proper activity to keep the hand well occupied. So the pr problem is, do we want to fool ourselves again or do we want to accept strange abstractions that mean nothing in daily living? We, are we going to follow out into some starry mystery world beyond when we can't live decently here? The thoughtful person, again, is looking for basics, looking for foundations upon which to build and gain for himself a proper form or pattern for daily existence. So we find always that the individual has to work his own life into a pattern of consistencies. Wherever so-called mystical experiences arise without proper discipline of character, there is danger. There is the possibility that the person is being self-deluded or is being deluded by others because he is willing to accept a shortcut to enlightenment, which does not exist. Therefore, we start in on basics. We have to earn the ability to use them. Our basics in religion come very simple and very easy. Religiously, the beginning of religions, religion is religious conduct. The individual who lives the religious life will receive the consolation of an internal religious adjustment. If he earns an inward enlightenment in the field of religion, he will receive it. If he does not earn it, he must take second-hand hope from others who may not have found it either. So I think they have to take into consideration immediately that all solution is a matter of growth. It is not a matter of matter primarily of what society is doing or institutions that are being built. It is primarily the individual correcting his own mistakes. And by correcting his own mistakes, increasing the area of his insights and understandings. When the person has found a proper level of internal adjustment, then he can read with benefit. Then he can study with success. Then he can study any art or science, trade or craft, and unsole it from within himself. He can be a carpenter, but he can also be a mystic carpenter. And a mystic carpenter does not mean that the carpenter starts to build houses in the abstract elements of space. He builds the house right here, but he has within himself an insight, 
as to what it all means. And like the Essenes of the Holy Land, who were carpenters by trade, he builds, put the best he knows into it. Everything he does is a masterpiece from his own heart, because it is through building homes for those who need them that he worships God. All constructive labor is worship, and labor without worship is very little reward, and very often leads to a, a shoddy and inadequate relationship with the jobs at hand. So religion is work. Religion is doing these things in everyday existence. Religion is the individual who worships by keeping the integrities of life. He worships by caring for his children. He worships by maintaining the ethics of his community in every way that he can. He worships by being honest in his weights and measures. He worships also by forgiving his enemies. He, be, he worships by meeting every responsibility that is normal to him, growing through the fulfillment of proper activity rather than the effort to avoid or evade it. All avoidance and evasion is contrary to the natural law. So natural law stands there, and those who have worked with it, those who have really gotten together and made a real good job of it, have found that nature is with them. They will find and always have found that the only way to be happy is to keep the rules. And the rules were not made by men. And most men-made rules are not very good. So we go on then and we say religion is the problem of living every day as we should. Now no one is going to be perfect. It is not expected. But it is expected that every individual will make a good try. And by making a better effort will become more capable of understanding what religion really is. The person who has no interest in living it cannot possibly understand the meaning of religion or its importance in daily conduct. Therefore, we try in every way that we can uh, to make worship manifested in works, and that everything we do well glorifies that power that does all things well. And when we keep the rules of the universe, the universe keeps us. Now, another angle of the problem comes into, we will say, education. Now, here we have the mind at work. Now, the most peoples are ruined, more or less, mentally, by the attitudes of their parents and ancestors. The family mistakes are carefully passed along for fear that somebody might outgrow them. It is necessary to keep the feuds alive. And you know that as that goes on, more and more people are more and more unhappy. What is the purpose of education? Well, it's very obvious. If you take the right course in the right school, you can probably become a millionaire in the course of time. You will also be dead in the course of time. And the millions that you have will go back to the government. And the only one that really aids or gets anything out of all of this struggle is the tax that you pay the government. But actually, the problem is education should and must sometime recognize that it is related to the individual learning to live constructively. A person who has a good education has found an outlet for some ideal, dream, hope, or aspiration within himself. He is get, coming to learn the tools of his craft or trade. He is a builder, but he has to learn architecture. He is a mathematician, but he has to start with a uh, multiplication table. He wants to make great pictures or write great music, but he must start and learn the skills to do it. And when he has those skills, he must use them according to natural law. He must not profane or corrupt anything of beauty. If he does, he damages himself. He must never sacrifice quality for profit, or he will destroy his own ethics. And when he destroys enough of these ethics, he does not know what to do next, so he goes to narcotics or alcohol. Actually, each person who learns a profession or a trade or a business career is earning a way to use his religion. 
to use the divine overtones within his own nature. Education must include all of the basic elements of religion. It must include the golden rule. And no individual who does not learn to forgive his enemies can ever consider himself to be truly educated. He is learned and schooled, and he is going to be in the same trouble that the learned and the schooled have been for ages. It was a good educational system, but it didn't prevent the Inquisition. It did not prevent over 800 wars in the last 2,000 years. But civilization is not merely a vanity. It is not a great competitive field of extravagance. Civilization is the individual gradually growing up to the point that he knows what is right and has the strength and courage and wisdom to do what is right. So education needs a thorough house cleaning. We do not need all this abstract kind of thing without some emphasis upon use. We can create artists and musicians and scholars. We can create lawyers and doctors and psychiatrists. We can produce all kinds of people. But the main thing education should give these young people as they grow up is the realization of the responsibility of right use. To have a skill and not know what to do with it or a skill and consider that it is perfectly proper to abuse it for personal profit at the expense of others is barbarism and, most of all, total ignorance. The individual who does not have a right motive for what he does is ignorant. He cannot say the motive does not exist, because in a strange way the very person who is breaking the rules hopes that other people are not going to break them also at his expense. He doesn't want to be hurt, but he doesn't mind hurting someone else. So always education must be dedication. The individual must realize that knowledge is a divine bestowal. It is made possible by the faculties of the individual and by the basic structures of society. It is something that he must respect, something that he must use, it doesn't mean that he is less practical. He knows he must make a living. He knows that he must be responsible for his part of the world's burden. But he will know also that in making this adjustment, he is certain, he is a servant of truth. He is working for a great cause, the gradual and inevitable unfoldment of human nature and collective humanity. Then when he gets down to the trades and business of life, he has his offices and his secretaries and his clerks. He has the factory with all his workmen and all this type of thing. And in his business relationships as management, he has a little universe of his own. For the individual who rules a business that has 15, 20, 25,000 employees, this ruler is a kind of god. He is something more than just an ordinary person, for he has a right, a physical right, to discharge or employ. He has the right to criticize or applaud. It is his responsibility to manage this particular group of people. Now he has responsibilities to these people. He has responsibilities that may interfere with profit. But if the responsibilities are ignored and profit becomes the principal aim, he with his business is going to be in the same general condition that the world is with its own unfinished business. He is going to find the temptation to exploit the privilege of leadership. He will exploit it politically, socially, scientifically, professionally. But the moment he exploits it, he breaks faith with truth. And the moment he ba breaks face with truth, his own personal life begins to fall apart. And one of these days he will find that he has sacrificed too much to vanity and has not kept the faith that alone could make him a real person. So in business and all these fields of activity as we see them today, we see a crushing competitiveness. We see a world struggling for domination. 
We find people in all walks of life locked in conflict with each other. We find no one hardly willing to excuse any defect in others, but expecting to have all others excuse his defects. And little by little, every part of society comes through loggerheads. We have it today. We no longer in a world in which people uh, fought on the basis of principles. Now they fight over the same principles. Uh, we have many different sects of people who believe in brotherhood and are at war with themselves and each other. We find a tyranny of conflicting creeds. We find that religion is gradually entering into a great competitiveness in which it hopes to take over the world for its own creed and, dis and eliminate all others. This type of competitiveness is certainly not according to nature. In nature, variety adds to beauty. Here we cannot tolerate variety if it interferes with our own conceptions. What would the valleys and the mountains be if there was only one kind of flower? What would we think of the wild creatures of life if there was only one breed? What do we think or how could we get along with one system of thought if all else was removed? Everywhere variety is life. The combinations of nature are all symmetrical and harmonic. The great music of the ages is infinite variety on a simple keyboard. And yet that variety gives us great joy and great pleasure. What would we feel like if somebody struck one note for hundreds of years and never changed? We would say it is impossible, incredible, unbelievable. So change and variety is life. It is a wonderful thing that we have a half a dozen major religions and maybe a hundred smaller ones. As long as all of these religions keep their rules, do what they dedicate themselves to doing, and learn to be pleasant and tolerant with each other, variety is beautiful. But now we can't stand it. If, it, if we can't convert them, we're going to destroy them. And this is true all over the Near East at the present time. It is true in a large part of Asia, and it is increasingly true here in America. We cannot stand differences of opinion, although nobody knows who is right. Right hasn't any part in it. It's do you agree with me or don't you? Well, no matter how many times we try, there's always be somebody who doesn't agree with us. So it becomes an endless conflict, strikes and agitations and bombings cruelty, and we think we are civilized, grown-up people, and that the past was made up of barbarians. Many of these barbarians were much better people than we are, even though that we do not realize it. And we can take their virtues and get over some of our own vices with benefit to all concerned. We know that in many parts of the world today, comparative religion is acceptable but we are trying to kill it out here because of various motives. Some of these motives are very sincere, others are not. But the individual does not have to surrender to anything that is less than tolerance. And tolerance is more than just willingness to endure. Tolerance is the ability to get along with, to work along with these things in a constructive manner. So we think that the basic problem is a little bit like the famous three-headed Brahma in the great cave, cave temple of, El, of, of Elephanta in the harbor of Bombay in India. Three faces of one God. In some of the early missals of the Christian church, Christ is represented with three faces. And all through theology, the three-faced being was part of the philosophy of the Knights Templars and also seems to sneak into some of the mystical works of the 17th century. One being with three faces. In fact, this was one of the great problems of conflict in the early church, with the various conventions trying to decide how to solve the problem of one in three or three in one. This situation means actually that the divine power is three-faced. It has the three great likenesses, the three great visages. It has three eyes, 
the eye of the heart, the eye of the mind, and the eye in the palm of the hand, as we find in Oriental imagery. These three faces represent the three basic powers by which the universe was created. We don't know where and when it was created, and science doesn't seem to be in any danger of finding out. <laughs> it has uh, going to do all kinds of things, but when it gets through trying to find what's inside of the black hole, it will find another smaller black hole, or a larger one, and so on, infinitum. It will not ever come to the end, because the surface of things is never final. That which must be found within things, the search inward towards cause is the only thing that can possibly result in the re release of the plan or purpose for existence. In any effect, however, at least how you look at it, the problem goes on that each individual must find the way to use the three faces that he has within himself. Some say that one face is to the future, one to the past, and one is now. All over the world there are trinities of one kind or another. The one, the beautiful, and the good was the great trinity of Socrates. There is always this threefoldness of things. This three uh, levels of thinking, of feeling, of being, which must be brought into harmony. The hand must be trained to do the will of the spirit. And the will of the spirit does not mean to use it to knock down somebody. The problem of the hand is also the skills to create beauty, to make those things that are necessary to human good. The hand that holds the hammer is also the hand that holds the pen, writes the books, writes the songs, plays the instruments. All of these things are labors of the hand. And these labors must be taken hold of, they must be studied, they must be worked with, until the hand becomes an instrument of universal good. The good in each of us must express through the hand, because there are certain things that cannot be done except with the aid of the hand. It is the hand with which the good Samaritan must raise up his brother. The hand is the hand we shake hands with, even though at the time we do it, we may not know what we are doing. In the early days, handshaking was a very interesting thing, and maybe this has come down to us also, uh, more, really, that, more than we realize. In the ancient days, men shook hands, and they shook hands with their right hands to prove they were not holding a weapon. In other words, uh, the handshake was a symbol that the individual was not planning or aiming to hurt the other person. He was not going to cheat him. He was not going to stab him in the back. He was not going to hit him. He was going to prove conclusively that at that moment amity existed between himself and the other person. Now when we shake hands today, I wonder what it means. I wonder if we're sure that the fellow we shake hands with is not going to foreclose the mortgage the next day. It doesn't mean anything now, it is simply a gesture. But it had originally just as much a real meaning as any mudra or hand posture of religion. It was a symbol of brotherhood, of fraternity, of trust, of peace, and cooperation. And while it had those meanings, it was significant. Those meanings should come back. If they do not come back, the handshake means nothing. If it does not seal a cooperative relationship, it means nothing. The same way with all of the labors of the hands. Everything should have some use for it, some goodness in it. And the hands that are clasped in prayer are only acceptable to the Most High if those hands have worked for the good of mankind. We give our hands to God in prayer, and in so doing, rededicate them to the universal labor of human betterment. It's the same thing with our minds. We have minds, we have all kinds of thoughts. Some of them are not anything to brag about, and some are really quite noble in their way. The great sermon, the great poem, the great literary epic, 
the great book on philosophy or theology, all these things are products of the mind in action. The mind's purpose is to be dedicated to the advancement of the common good. The mind has to work out a whole series of decisions in itself. It must realize that it can contribute humor and happiness, that it can make life easier by properly uh, addressing a need. It also find, we also find out that the mind is the better for the wider knowledge it possesses. But knowledge is not necessarily merely book reading. The great knowledge comes from daily living. Paracelsus said those who would read the book of nature must walk it with their feet. Um, the, the kind of knowledge that we find in Bacon's essays is a knowledge that comes from a quiet contemplation of what is real and what is necessary and what is good. It is a sifting out of things that are useless. It is the ability to curb the tongue when it might otherwise say something that is unpleasant. And of course the mind must never prevaricate. It must never lie. It must never bring false witness. It never swear to something uh, that is not true. Nor should it try to sell inferior products by a big advertising program. All of the great uh, industrial activities are keyed to mind, but a great many of them are used are a use of the mind to exploit the lives of other people. We can protect ourselves against this, and we can try in our own lives and our own ways to use the mind always for as much good as possible that we use it to think things through, that we use it to decide how we can serve others best, that we can use it to remind us of jobs and duties, responsibilities, and most of all, that it is an alchemist, by means of which all responsibilities can be transmuted into opportunities. All these things are parts of the mind's labor. It must gain all knowledge that it can, and use all that it has gained, for the common good of all that lives. This was another one of Bacon's thoughts. Also, we come now again back to religion. Religion, in a mysterious way, is the sum of everything. Religion to each nation, each generation, each people has been a little different. But it is always the supreme over thing. Very few have really attempted to explain it completely. We know the various forms of worship. In the Peru, for example, the natives worship God by kissing the sunlight. A very abstract and unphysical approach. They didn't want uh, to have any physical form. In the Orient, letters and sounds of an alphabet take the place of figures in the worship of deity. But what is the real answer to it all? is this strange sense that we must have, which is the basis of an appropriate humility towards everything of life. We are in the midst of mystery. We have not solved this mystery. It is very possible that we can never solve this mystery until we become with it in an infinite future. That the only way we can ever know deity is to gradually grow up to the understanding of the infinite power at the source of life. In the meantime, religion is the great benevolent mystery. We have given it all kinds of names and thoughts. We believe that when we pray, our prayer is heard by something. We believe that in the, in the emergency, we are strengthened by faith in God. And that faith is faith in something something above ourselves, something more powerful, more useful, more immediate. Most people of religious belief feel convinced that deity is approachable, that they cannot understand deity, but that deity can understand them. And in this understanding, uh, they await the will of deity. And this will of deity is something that the world has loved from the beginning, and however it interprets, or however we try to study it, there is an immense strength there, the only strength man has. How can he have strength in institutions which he will sometimes survive, 
or which may for a short time survive him. How can he have confidence and faith and satisfaction in situations which have no value to anyone actually, including himself? How can he substitute wealth for peace of heart or peace of mind? How can adventure and change and uh, emotional stimulation take the place of this inward appreciation of value? Every individual, therefore, has to have this inner part of himself. And this inner part is the three-faced God. For all parts of knowledge, science, religion, and philosophy are attributes and aspects of one power. They are the basic breaking of one light upon a prism. They are the one power manifesting on three levels of function. There are other levels, but we do not know them. But in all things, the three move together. And the very processes of learning bring both the others into focus. There can be no philosophy without religion and science. There can be no science without religion and philosophy. And there can be no uh, philosophy itself or no religion or any of these things except in the compound of the three. They must work together. They are aspects of one thing, conditions of one quality, expressions of one life. And in this time, where we are under such burden of stress and so many problems are afflicting us, it seems very important that the individual should try to get rid of the conflicts and prejudices and conceits which he has regarded as loyalties. What is loyalty? Finally, it is loyalty to truth as we know it or as we are capable of understanding it. Truth for man is relative. It is truth for, for his kind in its own time. He must try to supply that which is necessary to preserve the best in things as they are, rescue the best from things that have been, and dedicate the best to the unfinished labors of the future. All these things are part of the problem of living. We don't want to have it appear, however, that this all adds up to a pretty heavy job, that it's something that... Uh, we should approach with trepidation. Actually, the doing it right procedure is a thousand times more simple than what we are trying to do for the most part today. We are not uh, really achieving in comparison to the energy that we are expending. It is very much like the problem of taxation. The taxes go up, but the buying power of the money goes down. And in all the money that we spend, we may still not be able to actually bring the necessities of life to the human beings on this planet. We can't do it this way. We cannot solve our problems by trying to follow political structures or any of the traditional values. The world is more inhabited now. In the time of Plato or Socrates or Pythagoras, there probably were less than half a billion people on earth. Today we are pressing uh, six billion. We have a world that is more and more indebted to a little planet. A little planet that is our hope of glory and our hope of salvation. We have done everything we could do to wreck that planet. We haven't followed the Egyptians who refer to, the, to our planet as Mother Earth and worship it as the source of all life. We don't worship the earth anymore. We're too sophisticated for that. We're too smart and too wise to pay homage to our own source of life. We are not worshiping the earth, but also we are therefore not careful of our use of what the earth provides. We do not recognize the harvest as a marvelous gift of nature, and we are not certain as to whether or not the farmer can continue to survive. All the things that would make things a little nicer, a little better, have in them an element of worship. There has to be something that we care for, something that is thus a little more sacred than we have considered it usually. Our petroleum is something also. that We just go out and use it. We don't realize the fact that maybe someday we won't have it. And therefore, our best process would be to be wise, loving, unselfish now, 
and help to keep these resources as long as possible. It is astonishing, one of the great wonders of nature, that the earth is able to sustain us. That in some mysterious way, even though populations increase, they survive. And they survive because there is something more than physical structure to the earth. It is a center upon which energies from the sun and from other planets converge and keep a constant process of reformation and rehabilitation. The earth is forever producing, not only the grain in the earth, but in the clouds, the water, everything. Nature has given us a tremendously complicated and incredible boat on which to sail across the sea of life. It has given us something that no human being could conceivably make. And behind the little part of it that we see is an intricate machinery extending throughout the whole of space. We are part of a tremendous thing. And this tremendous thing is obviously dedicated to good. As far as we can see, it is working for us. It is doing for us everything that is necessary to keep us alive. Everything that nature does is constructive and productive until man abuses it. So we are going to have to recognize religion as a reformation that gives us the internal insight to stop abusing the natural benefits and benevolences with which we are surrounded. Everything is part of something good. A man is a kind of a wayward child. The individual is a little bit of a delinquent and a little bit of a perpetual adolescent, but he can get over both with a little effort. And now, in this time particularly, we are beginning to realize the facts of life. We are realizing the fact that each day may bring a new complication. We are realizing the fact that half the world today is locked in struggle to the death. We are in the evidence that the various policies and various patches we have put on world conditions are not right and are not holding. Therefore, we are now getting very close to the time when we have no real recourse, no escape from the terrible necessity of doing something right. We are going to be finding that unless we do it as it was intended, we will continue to have trouble. But if we do keep the rules, they will keep us. So now, in the middle of a great emergency, more and more people are beginning to think. They are beginning to dream of getting together and doing things. They are beginning to realize the concept that was set forth in Bacon's New Atlantis, which he said, which is America. And in which, according to his concept as a scientist, there would be a great world of progress, great libraries, great schools, great laboratories, observatories, a vast accumulation of truth-seeking facilities. And he says that these truth-seeking facilities, all the products of human ingenuity in this wonderful new world, will be dedicated unconditionally to the advancement and well-being of humanity. There will no longer be development for private profit, in that sense of the word. But everything that man discovers will be used to help man to grow. Uh, We've made more discoveries, probably in, in this country, than all the rest of the world put together. Now comes the time to redeem these discoveries, to convert them, to a great moral ethical code, to make them part of a worldwide and eternal program of fulfilling the divine purpose as it has been set in the hearts and souls of human beings. If we do this, we'll find an answer. And, of course, we will do it, because nature will keep on making us miserable until we're tired of it, until we suddenly wake up someday and say, this misery is due to me and not to the universe. I am not the victim of a despotism somewhere out in the vicissitudes of space. I am the individual who, in the presence of right, have continued to be selfish, who have continued to think of myself only in a time when everyone must unite 
for the common labor of survival. Out of all conflict, then, may come an alchemical form of transmutation, the base elements of the human experience, whether it's social, political, religious, philosophical, economic, all of these base elements must be transmuted into not only pure gold, but according to the alchemists themselves, the elixir of life. Out of all these experiences must come the nutrition of enlightenment, a nutrition by which all people working together, using the resources of nature as they were intended to be used, and finding out the meaning of things, and dedicated to the right use of everything we know and possess. As this time comes, I will find our problems fade away. And instead of being poor little outlawed creatures who have nothing to live for because we can no longer be dishonest, we will be very happy creatures, realizing that from the beginning, we would have been happy if we kept the rules, and that until we keep the rules, problems will pile up. So the basic fact today is to keep the rule, to find all that we can on every branch of learning that tell, can tell us what to do now that is permanent, what is solutional for ourselves, how to get rid of the nagging grudges and all the selfishness and bitterness and conspiracy with which we have burdened the human race. When we find the answer to that which is making us miserable, we will find that we will be happy, and that happiness is not something in which we can no longer do what we want. Happiness is now and can be in the future the magnificence of doing what we should, and by so doing, being a better world for ourselves and those who come after us. The basic problem today is to get back to the principles, to get back to the common values of life, as stated in every great religion in the world, and believed by practically everyone who has lived prior to this glorious era of enlightenment in which we believe in nothing. To get back the sinful beliefs of childhood, to get back to love as a solution and hate as something that died out long ago. When we get to this type of point in the uh, condition in our own lives, we will find it's not going to be too hard to keep the world happy and to keep our planet floating quietly, gracefully, and peacefully in orbit. It is up to us to do these things. If we make mistakes, we must correct them. Nature is patient. Nature can absorb into itself all mistakes. But the problem of absorbing a major mistake is a little uncomfortable. And we should try in every way possible to avoid that. Get back to the basic, simple facts of life. And let all the involvements and all the pretty patterns rest for the moment. And realize there is no answer to the problem of survival for us and growth and progress, except to make the necessary changes in our own natures so that we can live together in peace, serving each other and worshiping God with a clear conscience. Well, that's it, folks.